Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Um, I hope we can all agree that our life experiences really define who we are. It, it changes our perspective on how we view the world. Um, and there are certain things that happen in our life that are truly transformative, things that change the pathways that our lives take. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story uh, about how I got interested in this most complicated brain. Uh, but it really falls down to memory. Memory formation is paramount to make us who we are. So I never thought that I would be on a stage with a brain on these huge screens in front of you. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was actually very content learning about microbiology. And at the time, we were learning to, to express human proteins and things like E. coli. But then something happened. Something happened that really changed my life. This is my grandmother. And when I was in college, my grandmother began to show signs of dementia. Now, this didn't happen all at one time. It was very gradual. I think the first time that the family was concerned was when we went to visit her and we saw that she had burned the cookies. Now, my grandmother had never burned anything in her life. So we knew that there was something wrong. She simply put the cookies in the oven and forgot about it. But her dementia really progressed quickly. And she eventually lost her ability to live independently. Uh, and eventually we were just unable to care for her as a family. And I remember going to visit my grandmother and she couldn't recognize me. Uh, she thought I was somebody named Will. And we all knew who Will was. Will actually worked on the farm that her and my grandfather owned some 60 years earlier. But it really hurt me. Uh, it really affected me that she couldn't remember who I was. And after a while I didn't try to convince her that I was her grandson. Um, we just talked about old times. And it really struck me that the disruption of her memory from day to day, and even her, her memory of me, really affected the, the time that we had left in her life. But it also struck me that the memories that she had, the long-term memories, 50, 60, 70 years ago, remained intact. They were there. And as a matter of fact, in the last part of her life, she lived a lot of her life in the past. So I changed from microbiology to neuroscience, and I got my PhD. And I was lucky enough to land in a lab that was a leader in the field of learning and memory research. And that was Dave Sweat's lab at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And, and Dave was a fantastic teacher. He would ask us these really far-reaching questions, uh, not just about the molecular mechanisms of learning and memory, but broader ones like, is learning and memory in the human limitless? Well, I always thought that the human brain was kind of similar or analogous to a computer, right? So you had your RAM that you had working memory all day long, and then your long-term memories were laid down on your hard drive. And eventually, just like the hard drive of your computer, it would fill up with information. But he said, well, what about people like this? This is Kim Peek. He's known as the human Google. <laughs> now, he had an extraordinary ability to store and recall information. As a matter of fact, they tested him, and he could read up to 10,000 words an hour, several books a day. Okay? And he could recall a particular passage in that book perfectly, verbatim, weeks, years later. He could tell you the publisher, uh, the day that he read it. He could even tell you what the weather was like outside the day that he read that book. So this would say, well, maybe memory isn't limitless or it actually is limitless, especially in the, in the case of Kim Peek. But maybe he's an anomaly. Maybe this can't happen with everybody. Uh, but Dave would say, well, maybe it can. Maybe all of us have the ability to remember things with perfect clarity. Okay, so we're going to do a little experiment with all of you in the crowd. I'm going to try to make you remember something in your past, something that happened in your past. Okay, and I'm going to try to make you remember it in complete clarity. So I just want you to look at the screen and look at this picture. Okay, now when you look at a picture like this, it brings up a lot of memory. But those of you in the audience that are old enough to remember, I remember exactly where I was, who I was with, what I was doing when I first saw these images on the television. This is what's considered to be a flashbulb memory, a very, very strong, strong memory. And it happens all the time. It can happen to soldiers that are in combat, uh, it can happen if there's a traumatic experience in your life, a car wreck, an assault, a death in the family. But something like this, I mean, it didn't personally affect me. I didn't know anybody who was hurt or killed in 9-11. But I can still remember that day with complete clarity. 
But these are facts and events, and human learning and memory is much, much more complicated. So we'll do another little test. I want you all to picture an elephant in your mind in as much detail as possible. Okay? Now, I'm assuming you're not thinking about this, something two-dimensional. No, when you think about an elephant, you think about what an elephant really looks like, its color, its texture, its shape. You're probably thinking about it in more detail than what's even on the screen, how it moves, what it sounds like. Okay? You're not pulling this out of your brain as the elephant memory. Instead, you're bringing all those experiences that we talked about earlier together, experiences that you had in reading, seeing elephants on TV or in the movies, seeing them in the zoo. You're bringing all those experiences, all those modalities together to make a mental representation of that elephant in your brain. And trying to understand that on a molecular level is extremely, extremely difficult. So how can we do this? Well, we can study the human brain, and we've done this pretty well with imaging and other techniques. But to understand what's really happening on a molecular level, you have to get into that brain. We don't necessarily even have to do it in a non-human primate like a monkey. We actually can do it in a mouse brain, this really small brain. And it is smaller than a human brain, much smaller than a, a monkey brain. But it's a mammalian brain. It has all the same structures as you have in your brains right now. Now, the other thing that's interesting about a mouse is that it shares a lot of genetic identity with humans on the order of something like 90%. Now, this sometimes can be a little bit misleading, and this is the percentage of the genes that are similar between humans and other creatures, especially the mouse. But there are some genes that are so evolutionarily ancient that even their sequence identity is almost identical to that in a human on the order of upper 90 percentile. So these genes make proteins that are, like I say, very, very old proteins. And proteins that are likely to have the same molecular role in a mouse as they do in a human. And when I was working with Dave Sweat at Baylor College of Medicine, we started studying uh, one of those genes. And this makes the protein called relin. Now relin is this protein. We all have it floating around in our brains right now. And it associates with the synaptic connections, those places where neurons are able to talk back and forth to each other. And it modifies how well that communication occurs. And in the last 20 years, this large protein has been associated with a lot of different disorders, things like schizophrenia, autism, uh, Alzheimer's disease, different tauopathies, bipolar disorder, lysencephaly. And all of these disorders that I have shown up there have a disruption in cognition as one of its components. So how can we study these really, really complicated processes in a mouse? Well, one way that we can do it is with a very simple behavioral test. It's called the hidden platform water maze. And this is simply a big tub of water. You have a platform that is just underneath the surface. The animal cannot see it. And then you put cues on the walls, different colors, different shapes, so that the animal can orient itself. You probably left your seat. If you came back and sat in the same place, you were using the visual cues around you to find that seat again, or at least the general area. It's the same thing that a mouse does. And then we have a camera on the top so that we can look and determine how long it takes them to learn where that platform is. So here's a mouse. First time we put it in, it may not even know that the platform's there. I mean, we can see it because we're looking from above, but it can't see it at all. And this is what it'll do. It'll swim around and swim around until it eventually finds the platform. And once it does, we let it sit there for a while, let it orient itself, okay? And then we put it back in the water maze again an hour later. And we may do this four times in a single day. Now, in order to get the animal to really learn where the platform is, we have to do this day after day after day. And if we do this for eight days straight, what will happen is when we put the animal in the water maze, it orients itself, okay? It tells where it is, and it goes right to the platform. Now, we knew that if we disrupted the relin protein or the receptors that relin binds onto, we could disrupt this process. So we simply did a very simple experiment. We did the converse experiment. If we take relin out and it causes memory problems, what would happen if you put relin back into the system? And so we purified relin and we injected it directly into the brains of the mouse. We waited a few days and we decided to test it in the exact same way. Right? But we saw something interesting. 
on the first day of training, the second time that the animal went in, this is what it looked like. It oriented itself and it swam directly to the platform. A little bit quicker than this. But it would do it over and over and over again. No matter where we put it in the platform, it would find the platform. Now this is really amazing. And it started to concur with another line of research that I had ongoing. And this is an Angelman syndrome. Now Angelman syndrome, you've probably never heard of it. It's a very rare disorder. Children that have this disorder, they have a, a, a cognitive disruption component to it, just like those other disorders that I talked about. Um, they're developmentally delayed. Uh, and they have a really kind of unique symptomology as well. Now these are pictures of children that have Angelman syndrome that are very indicative of what you'd see. They always have a smile on their face. They always find uh, things funny and they're always kind of laughing. But they are kind of on the autistic side in which they usually don't form any language, they don't form any words, and they have sometimes difficult to control seizure. Now why Angelman syndrome? Well, when I was studying this stuff about Relin in Dave Sweat's lab at Baylor, right next door in another laboratory, they had found the gene for Angelman syndrome. And remember that slide with that 92% similarity in genes? Well, what these researchers did was they found the gene in the mouse that matched the gene for Angelman syndrome. And they simply disrupted it in the same way. And when they did that, they made a really kind of cool model. They made an Angelman syndrome mouse model. Now this Angelman syndrome mouse model looked very similar to what they saw in the children. It had seizure, and you could induce seizure what we consider autogenically. So if you made a loud noise on top of the cage, the mouse would seize. It had motor coordination defects, just like the children did. So these children usually take a long time to learn to walk. Uh, and they have balance problems, and the mice did too. So this is a maze where the uh, rotor rod is continually to turn and it's starting to accelerate. And mice that have Angelman syndrome, they fall off quicker once the, the rotor rod starts turning faster and faster. And you can see it, he just fell off. And we also knew that they had cognitive defects. So when we put them in the water maze, they didn't do as well. Now, something else happened, something else that happened transformed the way that I was thinking. And I had been studying Angelman syndrome and studying real and research for a number of years. But something happened in that I had met, for the first time, a child that actually had Angelman syndrome. So here I was studying this disorder, trying to figure out how it could control learning and memory, how it could change the way that these animals would learn. And I lost sight that it really had a human component to this. This is Ainsley, and Ainsley has Angelman syndrome. Now what I was shocked when I met Ainsley and her parents, Paula and Michael, was that Ainsley syndrome didn't define who Ainsley was. She very much was like my own kids. She was mischievous, she had a really good sense of humor, very loving. But her parents faced day-to-day -day challenges that was very difficult for me to even comprehend, especially being a father myself. Now, I pondered why these two things, these two lines of research I was doing had somewhat come together. And I think you know where this is going, right? So we did the experiment with the Angelman syndrome mouse. Can we purify Relin, put it in the brains of these Angelman syndrome mice and change their cognitive ability? So the mouse uh, with no relin uh, has problems with the water maze. It can't find the platform even after many, many days of training. But the mouse that we inject relin into the brain can find the platform, it orients itself, and it swims right to it. Now, you may be thinking, well, this is just kind of an interesting experiment. You know, what does it really mean? Well, at the time, it was believed that Angelman syndrome, along with a, a number of other cognitive disorders, was developmental in nature, which means that it occurred when the brain was forming in the womb. Now we can do a lot of cool experiments and we can do a lot of neat things with mouse models, but we can't rewire a human brain. And what this meant was that we could take a, a, a mouse that we had given Angelman syndrome to, it's had the symptoms its entire life, inject a naturally occurring protein into the brain and recover at least the cognitive defect. And this opened the door to limitless possibilities. If we can do this in the mouse, 
There's really no reason why we can't do this in the human. Now, the other thing that really struck me about meeting Ainsley's parents was that they didn't really care about cool experiments. They didn't really care about uh, uh, the, the, the next cool mouse model. They really wanted to know how the science could affect their child, how it could better their lives and the lives of the children with Angelman syndrome around the world. And so I kind of came back around, and I want to come back to this again, the brain. Because this isn't just any brain. This is actually my brain, or at least a magnetic resonance image of my brain. But my brain really hasn't changed all that much since I saw those burned cookies so many years ago and, and realized the implication of it. It has changed tremendously on, on that molecular level. It's changed my perspective. It's changed the way that I look at things. Uh, it's made me realize what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And so I was hoping that I would come here today and kind of change all of your brains, just a little bit, at a molecular level. You probably didn't even feel a thing. But I hope that from now on you will kind of look at that, that simple word, that word that we take for granted, and realize that it means a lot, that word being memory. And with that, I want to tell, tell everybody thank you.